Many years ago, many years ago, when I was first married, we've been married 47 years now, so that's a while, in the front yard of our little house in the Los Angeles area in a little town called Temple City, I was being played with a gopher. And so I got out my garden hose and I took a spade and I found where the hole went down. I could see a couple, three mounds. And I started that hose down in there and started running water. Well, I didn't know if my whole house was going to sink into a huge abyss before I got through because I had to run that water for hours. I don't know how far that guy had dug under the street and around the block and in neighbors' houses and everywhere else, but eventually I was waiting there and it began to bubble and back up and here came a sodden little golfer poking his hole out of that head and I was waiting for him with a trowel in my hand. And when he poked his head up and saw me, he tried frantically to get back in there, even with the water. I didn't let him. Boing, and that was the end of that gopher. Taught me a lesson. That is like millions of people the world over who have heard my voice and that of my father for all of these many decades and who have heard some of God's truth. Challenging truth, disturbing truth, sometimes truth that makes them angry. I've met many, many people in God's church who said, the first time I ever heard you, you made me so mad that I decided to look in my Bible and find out whether or not you were wrong. And a lot of people started to discover the truth by desperately trying to prove we were wrong. And it's just like that gopher, meaning that sin is below terra firma, groveling around in the dirt of this earth. And when you come up to the bright light of day, if the washing of the water by the word flushes you out and you suddenly look around and there's a bright sunshine up there and you're not used to it, you try frantically to dig your way right back down in where you were. I've thought of that as an analogy many times over the years. You know, most people have it completely backward. Jesus said in Matthew 11:28 28 to 30, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And the world has it absolutely backwards. And millions of people think that the most difficult, burdensome task in the world is to take the yoke of God's truth, things like the Sabbath, the annual holy days, tithing, attendance at God's feasts, the doctrines that they have held dear all of their lives, which are absolutely pagan and have no basis in fact, such as the immortality of the soul, going to heaven or an ever-burning hell the instant you die, the rapture being whisked away through the roofs of automobiles and aircraft, and the other doctrines, such as the pagan holidays, soon now will be coming to the end of October, that is after the feast this year, and about 10 days after the feast will be Halloween or Hallowed Evening. And I just completed another update article on that for the next newspaper coming out and was doing a little bit of touch up on it just this morning. And uh, Christmas with all of its uh, pagan trees and orbs and bulbs and Ishtar, Ashtaroth or Astarte or Easter as they call it today with bunnies that are uh, symbols of fertility and ratchet, rapid uh, procreativity and the symbols of spring and Ostara and uh, the goddess of life and uh, reproduction. And so they have bunnies and eggs and all the colors of spring and the like. Now that, of course, is freedom. That is a wonderful way of the world. But God's way of the Sabbath and the annual holy days are burdensome and a terrible yoke of bondage. Most people think of it that way. Matthew 23, 1 through 4, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. They were the inheritors there of the uh, Mosaic Covenant, saying, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, so long as they were sticking to the Old Testament of the Bible, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works. You've all heard the old expression, do as I do, don't do as I uh, say do, don't do as I do. I guess the way they ought to say it when they're talking about government today, but uh, most people don't say, don't follow my example, just do what I tell you. For they say and do not. 
For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. That reminds me of politicians that will inveigh against education and the deplorable state of public schools and the lack of good teachers and on. And they've got their children in a private school uh, with a tremendous amount of money and a great teacher-student ratio and all of the perks that one could imagine. And they will lay burdens upon other people with regard to taxing us out of our skulls and taxing us to the last dollar. And then they themselves, as it says here, will not touch them with one of their fingers. Satan and this glitzy, glamorous Hollywood world of ours make it look like the broad way that is lit, as Jesus said, wide is the way, broad is the gate that leads to destruction, and many of there be to go in thereat, is the way of fun and pleasure and instant wealth. That's why some of these television programs, Do You Want to Be a Millionaire, are so popular and the one about the wheel of fortune, and people just vicariously enjoy it when people suddenly get 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars. It's so exciting. Everybody hopes to have a Brinks bag fall out of the back of a truck right in front of them like happened to one black man years ago. He actually had to move when he turned the bag in and people would drive by and honk and stick their heads out the window and call him filthy names and give him filthy gestures until he was so beleaguered he had to pick up and move from his home because he was an honest man and instead of keeping that money he turned it in. Well, they've got it backward. Most people when they talk about it, I heard interminably, I just for the sake of refreshing my memory about the Sunday morning comedy hour here a few weeks ago, I was driving on a Sunday morning. And so I went ahead and I'm just flipping automatically around here and there through some of the Sunday morning radio programs. And oh, what I heard. I heard everything from Pentecostalism to the black Baptist churches to all kinds of them, the local churches and the national big names and everything. But one fellow was really inveighing against God's law and he called it several times legalism. He really was against legalism. Now, both preachers and politicians will use certain slogans, and they will have a ring of truth to them in the way that they present them to you, but they will be based upon false assumptions. And they will repeat those slogans endlessly, as this man did, so that the way he said it, and with the tone of his voice, it made you think the last thing in the world you would want is legalism. What is legalism? When you think about it. Now, if you want to get married, do you want it all bound up legally? If you buy a home, do you want there to be a title search and do you want it done legally? Do you want to make sure those documents prove to anyone who would try to come and take your home away from you that it's your home? If you buy a car, do you want it done legally? Do you want to have a warranty and is it legal? And can you enforce it if you have to by law? I don't care whether you're talking about buying an insurance policy, going off to school. Do you want it done legally? Well, would you like your neighbors to behave legally? Would you like the Attorney General of the United States to behave legally? Would you like the President to behave legally? I would. I think everybody would. They would love to see everybody but themselves behave legally. And these preachers somehow get away with that. How do they get away with that? How do they get away with audiences thinking the worst thing in the world is legalism? That means you've got to obey some kind of a law. That reminds me of when our current president, who's just about to go, and some people think he's got a ploy up his sleeve that will help him stay there, be that as it may, when he was being, uh, when he was running and he first was elected, he bamboozled the American people by telling them that the last thing in the world you would want is trickle-down economics. And he had a sign right back of his desk, it's the economy, stupid, remember that? And so continually he said the last thing in the world you would want, and he blamed it all on the previous administration, this terrible, terrible trickle-down economics. Now what does that mean when you analyze that? Just analyze trickle-down economics. What, what is he talking about? Gushing down economics? He's talking about the Brinks bag and the Wheel of Fortune and do you want to be a millionaire? The government is going to do all these things for you? What is trickle-down economics? Well, what about an entrepreneur who goes out to western Colorado and being a person who is a graduate of maybe the Denver School of Mines 
and knowing mineralogy, he goes out into the hinterland around Craig, Colorado, and discovers some seams of what he thinks might be coal. And so he goes back where he came from, and he arranges a big loan at the bank, and he places everything at risk, his very home, his background, everything that he's got. He bets on the idea that he can get that coal out of the ground. Now, he's only begun because he's got to go to the landowner or to the BLM. He's got to pay trespass. He's got to get permission to do it. He's got to tackle the environmentalists. He's got to be one sharp character, knowing what he's talking about, how thick, how deep, how wide is the deposit, can he get it out economically, can he make it pay, and eventually he arranges for a transport of the heavy equipment, he has gotten his government permit, he's gotten a lease from the landowner, and he has agreed to pay a certain percentage of the coal that comes out of the ground back to the landowner. Now in comes the heavy equipment and begins to strip mine the coal. But he promises the environmentalist that as he does, for all the tons of coal that he takes out, he's going to take the bulldozers and smooth it over and repair it and plant trees and make it beautiful so that they will hardly even know that he's been there. He arranges a spur to be built and the railway actually cooperates so that it can load directly from the processing plant which he has to erect because you've got to get the coal out of the ground and remove the impurities and get it in the chunks that will be loaded into the railway cars. When I drive out to West Texas, I do nearly once a year, if I get a chance to go hunting out in Colorado, and I'll be driving through all those little towns, there will be many trains of more than 100 cars apiece, and every car is exactly the same, loaded with coal. And here they come rumbling across the West Texas landscape from Western Colorado. And they're going down to a big steam generator plant. There are these all over the Southwestern United States, because not all of them have uh, hydroelectric power. And here will be, like in Craig, Colorado, a huge steam generator plant with these gigantic big stacks up in the air and smoke coming out of them. And the coal is being burnt to the rate of 100 coal cars per day in these great big steam generating plants to provide power and electricity for dozens of communities and farmers for several hundred miles all around. And all of those people then in their homes and their schools, their businesses and their hospitals, somebody on an iron lung, somebody on a dialysis machine, are benefiting. Now who benefits? Well, the landowner benefits because he gets a share of the profits. The entrepreneur benefits because he's making a profit. The banks and the lending institutions that gave him money are making a profit on their investment. The railways are making a profit for hauling the coal. The steam generator plant is making buku amount of money. You know what your electrical bill is every month. The people that the steam generator plant hired, maybe 200 of them, represent a large part of the labor force of a community that is suddenly, like Craig, Colorado did, find itself a thriving community with a lot more tax base, lots more consumers to purchase automobiles, refrigerators, and build homes. Everybody benefits. Trickles down, doesn't it? just trickles down until everybody benefits, just like a stream from melting snow trickles down the mountain, joins other streams, becomes a rivulet, becomes a brook, becomes a river, becomes a bay and an estuary, and all the way along people dam it, they drink from it, they get hydroelectric power from it, they irrigate their grounds and their, their farms with it, and everybody benefits. But no one paused to clarify for the American people the term trickle-down economics. Clinton got away with it because most people didn't think it through. They just thought, oh, that's bad because he said it's bad. Legalism is bad because they say it's bad. Well, that's merely a gimmick, and it's time that we understood the truth of God and don't fall for the gimmicks that are preached continually by some of these Sunday preachers that lie about God's Word. This day, the Sabbath, has never been a burden to me from the day of my baptism. It was previously. Oh, did I hate the Sabbath. I dreaded it. I, I really hated it when I was a kid in school. I hated my dad's religion. And in a lot of ways, I was pretty cantankerous toward my dad because it was almost as if I laid a blame on his shoulders. He's the one who made it up. He didn't have to believe all that stuff that these other preachers up there said up in... Uh, uh, Scra Scrabble Hill, Oregon, or wherever it was he went. I was a little kid in school, so I couldn't have gone out for football anyway. I weighed 136 pounds and stood 5'6 and 3 quarters. When I joined the Navy, I weighed 136 pounds and stood 5'6 and 3 quarters at age 18. 
at age 22, when I came out of the Navy, I weighed 160, 152 pounds, and I stood 5'9". So I was slowly developing, and had I not been able to get on a regular diet and regular exercise uh, in the Navy, I probably would still have been 5'6 and 3 quarters and, and weighed 136 pounds. But nevertheless, I hated it because I couldn't participate. I had to play like intramural basketball on a Wednesday night. I couldn't even go to the homecoming dance. Most of the dances, most of the sports events, all of the things that went on in high school went on on a Friday night or on a Saturday afternoon, Sabbath afternoon. I couldn't participate, and I hated it. Now, in later years, I have been thankful for that opportunity and for that challenge simply because instead of being like Oral and Richard, uh, I did not say, boy, my dad's really got a great thing going there. I mean, he'd been a fool to say so anyway. He had a little college that was about to go under. He was failing to the point that my dad once prayed for death and asked God to take his life when they found they had to fireproof those walls in the original building that he's written about in his autobiography. And he had four students and eight faculty members and no money. And so you think Garner Ted said, boy, my dad, Herbert W., has got a great thing going. I'll just latch on to him and we'll just go to great success together think again. There wasn't any reason at all for anybody to come to that kind of a conclusion. And so the minute I became old enough to do it, I began toying with the idea and I finally called, I won't bore you with a story, but I called a friend of mine who called me yesterday. I still keep in very close touch with him, Mr. Allen Hall. I borrowed his name for my son Mark's middle name, Mark Allen, and he borrowed his middle name for his son, Michael Allen. So they're Allen's uh, from Allen Hall in two generations of my family, and he knows that and deeply appreciates it. But he was selling used cars, and he wanted to make one more run to California and back to Oregon, and so he came down, and we held up our hands and joined the Navy. I went in to tell my dad that I joined the Navy, and he said, oh, no, you haven't. And I said, well, yes, I have. And he said, well, he'll see to that, and he was going to stop it. And I just kind of smarted off. I said, well, I want to watch you take on the whole United States Navy. But I said, I'm already in the United States Navy, and I'm due to go at 4 o'clock, get on the train, go down to Terminal Annex, and get off in San Diego and go to boot camp. Then my dad wrote a letter I discovered in his desk drawer. It really did break his heart. I really came to understand what I'd done to him years, years later, because he wrote a letter to himself the day I lost my son. And he thought that that was the end of me. I'd gone off to the Navy. But I did so to get out from under dad's religion. So don't think I don't understand the gopher that tried to get back in a hole in my yard. Because I do. And from time to time in your life, in this life, you may find yourself breaking a particular scripture which says, Be not thou envious of sinners, but be thou in fear of the eternal all the day. And sometimes God's people are envious of people who don't know the truth. And they begin to think maybe their burden is easy and my burden is heavy. Maybe theirs is light and mine is a yoke that really bears down on me and I'm really having a rough go. Remember the song, Nobody Promised Me or Promised You a Rose Garden? Well, the Bible doesn't promise us a rose garden, but on the other hand, a lot of us do have it backwards. Now that I understand about God's Sabbath day and look forward and say, I don't have to work. Well, in my case, I can't say that exactly, but it's not the same kind of work. It's more enjoyable work. I preach. I sometimes spend several hours in getting a sermon together or in thinking and praying about it and discussing it oftentimes with my wife. And uh, then I have to deliver the sermon and soak my shirt with sweat. But other than that, I don't work. <laughs> Although the Levites worked on the Sabbath, and that wasn't called work because that was their calling. But nevertheless, I certainly would not get out and mow the yard. I wouldn't be out digging a ditch. I wouldn't be repairing some problem around the house. I wouldn't be doing something with the car, maybe replacing a, a worn tire or something on God's Sabbath day. Now think that God's people, if they were to obey God 100% in observing His commands, I haven't put that upon the church for years. I have thought that perhaps that's more of a voluntary thing, meaning festival tithe, uh, than in the same category as is first tithe. But when you stop to think about 10% of your annual income available to spend on yourself, your immediate family, and or extended family or friends, and to have extra money even to give to other people. I'll tell you what it's meant to God's people over the years. Many people 
in the church in past years who would meticulously save that 10% were able to go to England and Europe. They were able to go to the Middle East. Some actually went to the Middle East for the Feast of Tabernacles. They were able on the Feast of Tabernacles on some occasions. I remember one guy decided they'd take a tour ship or a cruise ship. I'm not sure that's a great environment for the feast uh, with a casino aboard and everything, but nevertheless they did. And they were wandering around the Bahamas during the Feast of Tabernacles. People have gone to Australia. They've gone to New Zealand because we had churches down there. We had festival sites down there. And so people were able to see a part of the world that they could never have expected to see in their lifetime simply by being obedient to God and saving the festival tide. I can't even begin to tell you what would happen to me psychologically if I thought I've got to miss the feast this year. I so look forward to the feast and to meeting all of God's people. And I get the added benefit of going to as many of the feast sites as I can. When we used to have 11, I went to 11 and spoke at all of them, spoke 11 times in eight days. Now, this coming year, God willing, I will speak twice at each of our four feast sites and I'll get to see Panama City Beach and Lexington that I've been to see already and looked around the area there and it's very lovely. And of course up at Kimberling where my wife and I will have a unit that is right there on the lake. You can look out and see bass jumping and rippling in the early morning and then get to go out to uh, Lake Tahoe which is one of the most absolutely splendiferous jewels of God's creation that I've ever seen and I've been all over the world and completely around the world and there's nothing to compare with it on the entire earth that I know of. And to see those snow-capped mountains and that big beautiful lake so it is a wonderful opportunity in the very best time of the year. And I don't look upon that as any kind of a terrible burden. It's just not a horrible thing for me to have to do. I mean, my wife and I will eat many meals on the run in an airport. No big deal. We don't mind because, you know, I need to lose a little weight anyway. And uh, so we don't feast all the time. But when we land at a site, if we get there early enough and we have an evening with a group of God's people, we'll sit down to a real feast. And we'll have some nice, uh, maybe, you know, prime rib and baked potatoes or whatever. A lot of God's people will not eat in a restaurant once in a year. But they go to the feast, they will eat in some of the nicest restaurants. They'll enjoy an imported bottle of French wine with the family. And they will get everything that goes with it and they'll really enjoy it. I don't think God's people look upon that as some kind of a burden. As a terrible yoke of bondage. In God's word... Everything that he commands us to do has a double benefit. It has an immediate physical, psychological benefit. It has benefits with regard to our peace of mind, our mental health, our physical health, our prosperity, our families, our children and grandchildren, our entire way of life in the now, and it has benefits for all eternity. The story of the deathbed repentance of people who can live any way they wish and then, of course, always make it to heaven by the time the preacher preaches them there. I've known several such because I keep telling you that I live in a retirement community. And almost once a week, our flag's at half-mast. And I'll come into the gate and they will have an, always have a sign up there. And they will say, in memory of, and here only a couple of weeks ago, one of my very dear friends with whom I played a lot of golf and had some card playing sessions with, suddenly was gone. I said, I didn't know that he died, and, but he died. He was gone. And it was just a shock because I didn't even know that he was ill. But there was a flag at half-mast. But I also knew the man well enough to know that he never darkened the door of a church. He was quite profane. I won't mention his name. Uh, he took God's name and Christ's name in vain all the time. And I don't know anything at all about his business practices. I knew that he was divorced. He had a live-in girlfriend and that type of thing. But I don't judge him for that. I'm just saying that when it's time for the funeral, I've never heard a man preached into hell. Now, I know that people will write me a letter and say, well, I have. I heard one old, you know, uh, Church of Christ pastor that preached my uncle straight into hell. Well, I, I did get a letter like that, it seemed to me, one time where somebody was taking issue with something I said on the broadcast. But I personally have never heard that. And I've been to any number of funerals. And it doesn't matter what kind of a life they live. There they are, dead, white, you know, face up, flowers banked around, lid of the coffin open. And the pastor is talking about even now he's in the arms of the Lord. And they always say it that way. And... Uh, 
that's hard to figure. Now, I know that you cannot earn salvation. Jesus Christ of Nazareth makes that clear. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them, if they would ever quote the next verse in their Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. But when a deathbed repentance suddenly gets a guy the same reward as someone who has taken a vow of silence, someone who has rigorously fasted twice a week, as the Pharisee boasted before the publican in the temple, someone who has given over to abstinence and has gone without and has sacrificed all of his or her life. I told a story before about the place in Mexico City, I won't belabor that, of the little nuns and we actually looked through the glass sarcophagus and saw the mummy of one of them. And they lived in a bout of silence and never uttered a word in all their adult lives, just went around fingering beads and listening to distant chants and peeking through the kind of filigreed area where they could see the services going on for people who were able to talk and dedicated their lives to this false concept that God is somehow really he loves it. God is really taken with those who will self-flagellate themselves, deny themselves, go into asceticism and stoicism and just deny and be without. Now, which is the greater yoke of burden? Which is the greater burden to bear? Someone that can never share? You can't ever laugh. You can't ever say, oh, look at the hummingbird or look at a beautiful sunset. You can't, you can't take your baby up in your arm because you've sworn yourself to celibacy. You can't ever be a mother. And yet you do all of this. And then my buddy who takes God's name in vain and Jesus name in vain and smokes and does all the other stuff and everything all of his life gets to heaven just as quickly as the little nun that went through all of this. But that's the way it's set up. Doesn't seem to me like that's fair. It somehow does not seem fair that they preach that kind of religion, that you can actually live any way you wish and on your deathbed have a deathbed repentance and God says it's okay. Now the way a lot of my friends look at it, and I know because I've heard them say it virtually in these words, I'll just take my chances. I think that when it's time, the good Lord will take care of me. Millions of people in the back of their minds have that idea. I'll just take my chances. I don't know. I will say something, just a leading little comment to someone out there where I live, and you, you cannot believe how quick the subject will get changed. If they think I'm going to say anything at all about religion or anything at all about any kind of a principle, they will change that subject immediately. A dear friend of mine a few months ago came up to me and he said, Goner Ted, what would you think about conducting our men's Bible class over there at the church? And I said, I'd be delighted if, if they would ask me. I said, matter of fact, what I would do is to maybe go through things about the proof of God and evolution. I wouldn't get into doctrine or anything controversial. I'd merely talk about evolution and the proof of God in the book of Genesis. Oh, well, that'd be great. We'd really enjoy that and so on. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll check with the guys and get back to you. It never got back to me. <laughs> he, uh, I don't know, he's probably too embarrassed to tell me what they told him, but he never got back to me. Well, I told you about the time that I made the big mistake to preach a generic sermon out there from a little breakaway church group that was meeting in the lounge room at where I live. And uh, I decided just to go through something really non-controversial and waded through the eighth chapter of the book of Romans and expounded it about being begotten and then being born of God. His spirit witnesseth with our spirit that we are the children of God and if children then heirs and joint heirs with Christ. And I explained all of that. Never got invited back. Never got invited back. Gophers. Gophers being flushed out of their holes by the washing of the water by the word and they want to dig right back down in there again because they're very uncomfortable. People are afraid they will find out the truth. Mark and I talk time and again when I'm choosing a television program. And we say, well, this one will be all right with regard to quality, but don't expect any quantity. That is, don't expect very many calls. But our supporters and the people that like to hear God's truth really laid on the line will enjoy it 
and those few whom God may be calling will get something good from it, but the average person will not respond to it. And those include programs like, why would anybody keep Saturday for Sunday? And programs about the law of God. People just don't want to hear it. They don't want to know it. Because in the back of their mind, they've got this idea, not clearly articulated, I'll just take my chances, and when it's time to go, I think the good Lord and I can sort it out together. They don't think that they're lost. They don't think there's going to be any punishment. They think that God is going to take care of them. You know, when you're burdened, you can't fly. When you're burdened, you can't walk or run very fast. When you're burdened, you can't even stand up straight. And it does say in the book of Romans, the eighth chapter, that we have not been called unto bondage. And I know that some people are burdened by their churches because it was the Pharisees that Jesus said lay grievous burdens and heavy to be borne upon people while they themselves will not lift a finger. But the same thing is true of politicians. There are policies put in place. There are laws that are passed by legislators who themselves are above the law, who don't even obey the law. I looked at the weekly edition of the Washington Times just last night, the current one. And there is a litany in there of probably about 40 members of Congress and the House of Representatives who have been indicted, who have been chastised, who have been charged with everything from bribery to fraud. And the list is so long, it is almost unbelievable. Most of the names you wouldn't even know. They're not the greatest and the biggest names. And this does not include some of those who have been disciplined that are famous and that people know nationally. These are people that mostly you wouldn't even know who they are but they're the lawmakers. They are the legislators. They write the laws that we are supposed to obey. Do they bind grievous burdens and heavy to be borne? What about your income tax? What about your school tax, school board tax? What about your municipal utility district, or they call it the mud as well they might board uh, taxes and what they levy against you every single year? And then what about all the hidden taxes, and the state taxes, and the gas tax, and the luxury tax, and the hotel tax, and all of the taxes? You know that if I were to give EB, sitting here in the front row, $1,000, which I don't have to give, I'm sorry, EB, but if I did, this is merely, merely saying that if I had $1,000, EB is supposed to give the federal government, at his tax level, a percentage of that. Now, he's only got, maybe, depending on what his tax level is, let's say 35%, he should wish that it is, but maybe it's not that, that high. And uh, so he's only got $65, uh, $650 left. Well, he gives it back to me. He says, here, Garner Ted, I want to give you $650. Now, I've got to give the federal government 35% of that. So then I give that back to EB, and he's got to give the federal government 35% of that. And about four or five transactions like this, the original thousand dollars, we're broke because the federal government has taken every dime of it. And that's the truth, isn't it? That's the way it works. Now, if you lose money in the stock market, you can't take that off your income tax. If you lose money at gambling, you can't take it off your income tax. If you win, they nail you. You are going to pay tax. Do you think politicians bind grievous burdens and heavy to be borne? Well, the last time I looked, we work every year up until the middle of June, and every cent we make goes to the federal government to pay our taxes. From about the middle of June, 15th or 16th, the rest of the year, what we work is ours, but all of these other hidden taxes, the state taxes, the county and the school board and all the other, and the sales tax that you ring up the supermarket cash register, every time you buy anything, you are taxed a certain percentage of it. They clip it going and coming, the money clippers. And that's why Jesus chased them out of the temple. I was thinking of an analogy about being burdened and being able to fly, and I don't know why, but it came to me that up there at Big Sandy on that little 3,400 foot runway that we had up there when I would fly at a Falcon jet, our max gross was about 28,660 pounds. That's a full load of packs, baggage, and fuel. 
and we knew exactly what the speeds were. And if I was going left, right, left, right, I'd fly to left seat, right seat, left seat, right seat. The guy in the right seat, who was a co-pilot, has to call out the numbers when you're on the roll. And so they would say 85, 100, 120, V1, rotate. Well, V1 is the speed at which you can fly, and rotate means you rotate the aircraft. That means you pull back on the yoke and you fly. Well, at 21,000 feet with just a little bit of fuel because we're going to fly locally, that bird flew just like a fighter airplane. And it was absolutely exhilarating to have it down that light. And instead of the other weight aboard, like a full load of fuel and packs and bags where you just rotate and you'd hit the go around button on the flight director, I won't uh, you know, bore you with all of that, but that would cause you to raise the nose exactly to the V bars, which is approximately 25 degrees or so above the horizon. And you just climb out at a nice even level. But if you wanted to really haul back and go up about 50 degrees or so, you could do it weighing 21,000 pounds. And it was amazing how free you felt being able to fly without that burden of the extra weight. As you walk through life, if you are unburdened because you know the following things, you're free from sin, you are forgiven, you are not burdened or laden with guilt. You're squared away with all of your friends and your enemies. You don't have an enemy in the world unless they are your enemy, but so far as you're concerned, they're your friend. Your home is clean, scrubbed, ready. It's ready for the top, well, are there any dig dignities you can think of? Maybe uh, Tony Blair, I don't know. Maybe somebody's gonna show up. I'm trying to search you know, in our government for a dignity to show up. Uh, <clears throat> if you think we have one, well then whoever it is, you think it up. If you've got, you know, the lawn, the grounds, everything is ready. I mean, the crops are in the barn and the horses are rubbed down and everything is in its place and everything is finished. You've done a good job. Everything is squared away. Every housewife knows exactly what I'm talking about. There is no feeling quite so good as when you finish with spring cleaning. And you know that everything is spick and span and everything is ready for a white glove inspection. You feel good. I feel real good when I've done a particularly good television program and my son Mark says, wow, dad, that was a good one. That makes me feel very good. If I've done a booklet and Mark and my wife says, that's a great booklet, makes me feel very good. People come up to me and said, I just finished reading the Real Jesus book, and it was moved, I moved to tears and everything. It's a great book, makes me feel very good. A sense of accomplishment, a sense of doing something that helps other people. And so I feel very good. I feel unburdened. I feel light, like I've got a spring in my step and I can fly. I don't feel bent down under a yoke. I don't feel like I'm born down under legalism. I feel instead like I am free. Jesus Christ of Nazareth says, love even your enemies. Do good, be good, think positively. What's burdensome about that? But over in the Philippines, come Easter time, people will actually have themselves nailed to a cross. Men will actually put themselves, lie down, and have others pound nails through their feet and their hands, and then parade them through the street. You're aware of that, aren't you? Now, in some of the absolute blatant paganism, and that's Roman Catholicism in the Philippines and in Mexico, they do things like that and they call the Sabbath a burden. They call going to the Feast of Tabernacles at Tahoe or Lake Panama or Panama City Beach a burden. It just is mind boggling a little bit to me. I want to go to the 58th chapter of the book of Isaiah because this is one that has to do with our Christian endeavor as some people might call it. And it also has to do with the commission that God gives me and his church. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness. As if, in other words, they are portraying themselves as being a nation of righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. Did you hear about the people I think I told you about, and it was an article again in the Washington Times that I read just last night about the booing and the big placards that were hoisted in the front row or so of the Democrat convention. I'm not going to say Democratic convention, because Democratic is a political uh, theory 
where Democrat is a Democrat, and sometimes Democrats aren't Democratic, you know what I'm saying. But anyway, in the front row, here came the Boy Scouts, just young boys, young teenagers, Eagle, Eagle Scouts, going to, partic to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. And they were booing, we want gay scouts. And it's just unbelievable the power that some of these people have in this society of ours where the gays, so-called, and there's nothing happy about them, and lesbians uh, have such political clout. And so a major plank of the platform of the Democratic Party, right alongside things like Medicaid and Social Security, is we're going to, right in your face, force these gays and lesbians upon you. And we've got them in government, and we've got them right here in key positions, and we want them all to come out of the closet. You know, as I said before, Sodom didn't begin as Sodom. It began with one or two. My wife and I over the years here in Tyler, Texas have forsaken certain restaurants. Way back years ago, I remember two or three I could tell you about. I won't mention their name, but we'd go in there and all of a sudden here's some guy mincing along and I'm about to tell the manager I want that guy to wear a hairnet when he's standing over the, a hairnet when he's standing over the uh, salad bar uh, because it worried me. And so he's mincing along and another guy minces up to him and about the next time we come back, there are three of them. All of a sudden the head waiter is a queer. I like that word because they hate it. And so there are about three queers in there. So we say, I'm never going back there again. But one attracts another, and then it attracts another, and they attract each other, and they find out where the queers are, and then they all, pretty soon, the whole restaurant's queer. <laughs> and that's the way it happens in communities. That's the way it happened in ancient Sodom and Gomorrah. And if some of the queers had it their way, the entire Senate and the entire House of Representatives would be so-called gay and queer. They don't like each other very well. They have nothing to do with each other. <laughs> Yet they seek me daily and deny, delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. They love to go to church having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, wrote Paul to Timothy. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not. Oh. Why have we practiced abstinence? Why are we going through our religious endeavor? We, we take bags of groceries. We have meals on wheels. We, we help the sick and the poor. We do all these various things. Why do we do that and you take no notice? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and you take no knowledge? Behold, God answers, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exact all your labors. You're doing it, in other words, just for show and there's no substance there. You fast for strife and debate and to smite with a fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice be heard on high. That doesn't impress God. Is it such a fast that I have chosen? There's a beautiful song, I think by Dudley Buck, I forget who wrote it, is not this the fast that I have chosen? Uh, which is a, a spiritual kind of a song that I've sung in past years. A day for a man to afflict his soul, is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. <coughs> if you look up the dictionary definition of the word burden, as I did again this morning, it also has to do with oppression. That is one of the meanings of it, oppression. And under the political system in this country, millions of people are very deeply oppressed. When they propose a tax cut, the other party will lie about it and say he's just trying to get across a tax cut for the rich. What kind of a tax system should we have in place? Well, the government itself uh, should not really be empowered to do that because it ought to be a theocracy instead of the kind of government we have. And instead of, in, in spite of the flawed government we have, it's still the one of my choice uh, with all of its flaws. I wouldn't want to go to some other country and live under their government. We all believe that, I'm sure. But it ought to be a 10% flat tax. So it doesn't matter whether you make uh, 12000 a year you pay exactly 10% or whether you make 12 million a year or maybe 10 billion like Bill Gates or somebody, you pay 10%. It would even out, that's God's method, that's God's way. Of course, the guy that proposed that had no chance to ever be the nominee of either major party. So is not this the fast, meaning the religious endeavor, the religious activity 
that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry, and that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house, when you see the naked that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from your own flesh? And a lot of people, I've been astounded after what happened in my own family between my father and myself about the number of families that are completely estranged and the number of children that pay no attention at all to an elderly parent in a nursing home and the number of even sisters or brothers that have had a falling out and won't even speak to one another. I've been amazed that people even in God's church have told me time and again, people come up to me and tell me about a terrible estrangement between a dearly beloved member of their own family. They haven't talked to them, haven't seen them, don't even hear from them in 10, 20, 30 years of their life. Pitiful. It ought to be healed, but of course that won't happen until God's kingdom gets here, I'm sure. Then shall your light, when you do that, break forth as the morning and your health shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before thee, the glory of the eternal shall be your reward. Then shall you call, or after guard, as that can read, then shall you call, and the eternal will answer. Then shall you cry, and he will say, here I am. And we don't get that kind of response normally from our prayers. It isn't as if an instant answer oftentimes, and we're given the example of perseverance in prayer and of the unjust judge that was in bed with his entire family, and the widow lady that kept pestering, and we're told to keep praying, and that's fine. But when we have done all of these things, then shall you call, and the eternal shall answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away from you the midst of you, rather, the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and speaking vanity. The yoke, that's the burden that is placed upon other people by our dictates and our if we have a, a little bit of power, uh, we do so, and they certainly do in government. The putting forth of the finger, we used to call it the ambassador's salute, and it went like this. We used to call that the ambassador's salute. Started in the Garden of Eden. The woman you gave me. Who's ultimately responsible, is Adam saying? Well, God, you gave me the woman. I mean, sure, I ate the apple, ate the fruit, but the woman, she, she told me. The woman says, you know, the serpent, he, he caused it. And that's exactly what most of us do. The old ambassador salute, we used to joke about that, was to point in every direction except here. And God's salute is always here. I'm the one responsible. I'm the one that did it. I'm the one that needs to repent of it. I'm the one that needs forgiveness. Never that way, but always here. Looking into the looking glass ourselves and speaking vanity. If you draw out your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall your light rise in obscurity and your darkness as the noonday. And the eternal will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought. Oh, well then there are even physical rewards for living what I believe is not a burden at all or a yoke or a heavy burden, but a life of great cheerful freedom a life of great blessing and benefit. What does he say? Satisfy your soul in drought and make fat your bones and you shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not, like an artesian well, in other words, your whole life bubbling over with constant life-restoring, life-giving waters. And they that shall be of thee, that is your family, your progeny, your grandchildren, shall build the old waste places you don't come back and find something that you used to live in sunken into the ground. Instead, your kids decide that that is valuable, that it's traditional, that it's something that deserves care and maintenance. I remember Mr. Walt Curtis, who many years after his dad had sold the old homestead, went back up into the mountains of western Colorado, the other side of Steamboat Springs on the Yampa River, found the old cabin where he'd been born as a boy and managed to buy it and he fixed it up and he added on to it and he put in a bunkhouse and he had a herd of horses and he then later on had a mixed herd, some cattle and a lot of sheep. And he wanted to do that because his dad had been a pioneer and when he was a little boy he remembered that his dad had tied big jerry cans on the side of a couple of mules and they'd gone up what's called Service Creek and another one that is uh, forgetting the name, Harrison Creek and they had planted little bitty brook trout that they'd gotten from the state uh, hatchery. 
Well, when I went up there to hunt elk with him, we could go along that creek in its deep areas and catch wonderful little brookies and eat them on a fire that were many, many generations later because they had treasured that old place and thought traditionally this needs to stay in this family. They shall build the waste places. They shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the eternal, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then shall you delight yourself in the eternal, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob thy father. When did he ever do that? When did that happen? During the day of Isaiah? During the day of who? Ezekiel, when they were in captivity at the river Habur? When did this ever occur under the terms and conditions of the Old Testament? When did they ride the high places of the earth? Why, they suffered. They went into captivity. They died by their hundreds of thousands. They were carried away in waves of successive invading armies under the day of Shalmaneser. The, the Jews went into captivity for 70 years. They have been the most persecuted race of human beings ever since that time. Look at the pogroms of Hitler. What is this promising? It is promising for obedience to God, for doing good, being good, thinking good, and for doing what God says here with regard to your neighbor, with regard to feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and being a giving and forgiving person. And it talks about the Sabbath day. If you obey God's Sabbath law, it's far from a yoke of bondage. It removes that yoke and gives you tremendous freedom and blessings here and now in this life. Right now, it's talking about material blessings here. Riding on the high places of the earth and feed you the heritage of Jacob, your father. Jacob was a man whose herds grew enormously. He was really a multimillionaire by the time he died because God had blessed him in knowing about animal husbandry. And when he laid those strakes down to keep the cattle from getting at each other and had certain ones that were uh, forced to be in a certain corral, if you understand about the ring straked cattle, and laying down the pilled, as it says, meaning peeled, where it would look to be white poles, he was actually inventing for the very first time cattle guards. And so that he knew that the very best bulls should be put with the very best cows. And he was using that and knowing that he was going to be building a tremendous herd. So it came time for him to inherit that uh, big herd of cattle. He was really a very wealthy man in terms of having the number of cows and bulls that he had. These are physical material blessings. Then shall you delight, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the eternal is spoken. And, you know, no one seemed to be burdened with the churches and with his job more so than the Apostle Paul. I want you to turn back to the book of the, uh, let's see here, Philippians, yes, the book of the letter to Philippi. And read just the closing salutation in the fourth chapter. He has tried to give them some gentle correction. He had told them about how he had prayed for them, and he gave them the example of counting everything but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. And he told them in verse 12 of chapter 2 that they had to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Now in chapter 4, he is concluding this very brief letter to a church. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown. Isn't that beautiful when you stop to think of the way he felt toward these people in the little town, the little city of Philippi. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. And he gets very personal. I beseech Euodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Apparently there was a difficulty there and he just Mention our names right in front of everybody to be read out of the pulpit. And I entreat you also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful, that is, anxious for nothing. Don't be all upset, disturbed, and worried. 
But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. Every little thing you do, I don't care whether you're asking a blessing over the food in the morning or you're getting on your knees before you go to bed at night, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. And the peace of God is your life, your family, at peace. Do you know peace? Christ said, peace I leave unto you. My peace I leave unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. The world doesn't give you peace very long. It just gives you a little breathing space between wars and between troubles and problems. But my peace I leave with you, he said to his disciples when he was praying and at the Last Supper before he was crucified. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. There is no way that you logically, from some other person's point of view, from a carnal person's point of view, should be at peace when you're having all kinds of troubles. You're lying in the hospital bed and about to have surgery, as one of our beloved brethren just underwent and was at peace because he knew not only that his own prayers were being heard, but all of yours were being heard as well. And sure enough, God blessed that and it did take place. And it was successful. And he's got a new lease on life. And as we have saying before the services, he, we hope to have him around for a lot of years now. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, you're not going to get that on the media. You better look for it in this word. Whatsoever things are honest, same comment. Whatsoever things are just, you won't find that in government. You better find it in the Bible and among principles from the Bible that you can apply to life. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, you're not going to find that on television, are you? You don't find that in the Saturday morning kiddie shows, pure and lovely. You know, Lieberman apparently attacked the Hollywood uh, writers and producers and directors that produce all this mayhem and dismemberment and blood and splatter movies and garbage and violence and war and gore, uh, an appropriate name, uh, for what you see because there's a lot of gore on the scene, no, just bloody gore. Uh, and every one of them a Democrat. That's strange to me. There's not a conservative Republican among that bunch that produced those splatter movies of big saws and dismembering legs and blowing people away backwards with bursts of nine millimeter semi-automatic or automatic uh, weapons. And so you can't get things which are pure by emptying your garbage can into your living room. And normally that's what you do every time you turn on television. I watch television. I'm not going to be hypocritical about that. I do like to watch old, old, old classics oftentimes. I have not I'm, I could have to ask my wife, I think we've gone to two sit-down movies in 22 years, and it's been so many years ago that we, we darkened the door of a movie studio. I've forgotten how long it's been. It doesn't mean I don't watch a movie, because I will. But I'm still saying that you've got to filter it out. Uh, it's like when uh, they first came up with filter cigarettes. You wonder, you know, do you really filter it all out? Well, no, you don't. You just got to kind of, oh. As I used to read novels, and when I'd read a book, and if it had God's name in it, I'd have a pencil, and I'd blank it out. So the next guy to read it wouldn't get to read it. Uh, the, the words wouldn't be there. Uh, I hadn't been doing that lately, and I still see those words sometimes. I don't like it because it, it kind of bothers me. It's kind of like uh, you're participating in saying those things. And when you watch some of these TV shows, it's almost like you're, you're participating and your mind is being taken where the director uh, wanted you to go rather than where it ought to go. So I'm just saying, look out, because your te television set is like a big old garbage can, and every time you turn it on, you're just emptying it onto your living room rug. You've got to filter through the garbage to find out if there's anything in there that is nutritionally redeemable, right? And by and large, you don't find very much of that in garbage. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Think about virtue. It says meditate. Think about it. Think about things that are honest, things that are true and just and pure and lovely and of good report, good news. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly 
that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, your care for me and toward me, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, because he's talking now about his support that was material support in tithes and offerings from those people. I won't go back and read all of the 11th chapter of 2 Corinthians about the many times, five times he was beaten with rods or with whips with 39 stripes, or about twice being shipwrecked, or in dangers and one time stoned until they couldn't find a pulse, and it, the terrible things that Paul went through. Yet look at this man as an example of those who in whatever state he finds himself, he can rejoice because he can compare with the shortness of his physical lifespan and the terrible things we might have to endure. God doesn't promise us a rose garden, although roses have thorns in them. But the attitude that he had, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I've got to admire John McCain. You may not agree with his politics, and I don't all of them at all. He's conservative. I don't agree with everything the man says or he believes. But for a man to endure, and I've read a great deal about it, that kind of treatment, for all of those years in isolation where they tap Morse code on the walls, lying on a piece of concrete and being beaten and not getting anything but garbage for food and surviving it, that takes a kind of mental toughness that you won't find in one out of 100,000 people. Most people would break under that, and most of them did. And they would do and say anything, even make television programs scathingly denouncing the United States because they couldn't stand the torture. Jesus Christ would have endured, and John McCain did. And you've got to hand it to the man, because he's an example of someone who endured tremendous privation and hardship. I've learned in whatsoever state I am there with to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. I can identify with that a little bit. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Whichever it is at that time, it's God's will. Even this shall pass. Uh, God will, or shall pass, God will see me through it. It is to test my mettle. It's a challenge. It's an opportunity for one more check on the kind of temper that God is forming here, the kind of a person that he wants as a member of his family and his own son or daughter. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's a slogan to put in your mind and heart, isn't it? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do this. I can make it through this. I can tackle this. I can handle this. This is no big problem. It's just one more along the way. And the next one will be worse and bigger because I'll be that much stronger because I've made it through this one. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Notwithstanding, ye have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. Nobody else was willing to help him, but you only. For even in Thessalonica sent you once and again to my necessity. And he was there in that local church. They should have been helping him, but the people from Philippi sent it. And what did he say? Not because I desire a gift, but I, I desire fruit that may abound to your account, because it's good for you to give because that accrues to your account in heaven above. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell. And it must have been goods. It could have been a combination of money and dried fruit or vegetables or things that he could eat because he said a sweet smell, an odor, but it could have been also a metaphor. A sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. He was in Rome. It was written from Rome by Epaphroditus. He was under house arrest. He was looking at the possibility of being thrown into the beasts in the arena. And he had converts in Nero's household. Some of the people who waited on the emperor 
were members of God's true church. The Apostle Paul, facing all of that, is telling them all these wonderful things, whatsoever is true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, not a whimper, not a cry, not a, oh, woe is me, feel sorry for me, but just one of the most upbeat, wonderful conclusions and salutations to a letter to beloved brethren in the church that you could ever hope to read. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's a beautiful chapter, isn't it? There was a man who was not burdened. He wasn't under any kind of a yoke of bondage, but a man who suffered as none of us can ever begin to understand. And he counted it a joy, and he rejoiced, and he never whimpered. I can do all things through Jesus Christ, which strengthens me. And we can too. We can in this little congregation. We can in the church of God at large. We can in the intercontinental church of God, and we shall, with the help of Jesus Christ.